Hold on, there's a plane. Three helicopters. Oh my four. Oh no. This podcast is becoming an NCIS LA episode. <laughs> oh my is. goodness. <laughs> cool J is hanging from one of them. <laughs> I'm Charlie Sohn, a screenwriter and journalist. I'm Agnes Reese, a pop singer and songwriter. And this is Mysteries of the Euroverse. On today's episode, we're talking about Eurovision icons. First, we deep dive into what makes a Eurovision icon different from other pop icons. Then we talk to three real-life Eurovision stars. Linda Martin, who placed second in 1984 and won the contest in 1992 for Ireland. Elisabeth Andreassen, who appeared in Eurovision four times, winning in 1985. And Senhit, who represented San Marino three times, bringing the country and Flo Rida to the grand final. Finally, Barrett Foa, a fan favorite in the NCIS verse, stops by to play a game about the artists who live on in fans' hearts. Icon or I can't. Take a look behind the scenes at all the scandal songs and queens. So come along as we traverse. All the mysteries of the Euroverse All the mysteries of the Euroverse All right, we are back with another episode of Mysteries of the Euroverse. Magnus, how are you? Absolutely iconic. This episode is all about icons. You don't win and just automatically become an icon. Icon is another step beyond that. For the purposes of this conversation, we are defining Eurovision icons as the artists who live on in the hearts of Eurovision fans year after year. More concretely, these are the ones who are invited back again and again, either to compete multiple times or to be featured as performers during the week-long festival. I think the key really about the word icon and why it often is abused is that to be an icon, you really need staying power. You have people who have topped the charts and the world forgot about them, not icons. Right. In certain areas, staying power can be fairly simple. That is really the difference between the pop music industry and Eurovision. Pop icons, when they establish themselves, they have to be musically fresh. They have to grab people's attention, right? Eurovision icons are playing to an audience that's much more varied in age than the key demographics on the pop chart, right? Also, because of the fact that many of them return and compete in Eurovision decades apart from each other, they need to find a way to be timeless. We talked to Elizabeth Andreessen, and she talks about seeing these, like, 19-year-olds, like, flipping out. Right. She's right? like, how are these people who were born a decade after this song was performed, able to sing along with this song in a language that don't speak. Absolutely. So that makes the idea of being timeless more complicated for these Eurovision right. I- icons. Eurovision icons are expected to be wholly unique individuals, right? If you think about a Lady Gaga, you're like, this person is one of a kind. Eurovision icons have to live up to that too. But they also are representing a country, and therefore they're representing a national story. And you think about Eurovision itself, right? The minute they become Eurovision icons who are like super identified with the festival, they have to take on the baggage of the entire history of Eurovision. This episode should not be seen as a comprehensive list of all the icons because it would be too long. Rather, we're looking at what makes a Eurovision icon. And of course, we're going to be giving examples. So it's called the Eurovision Song Contest. I think, therefore, it would be best that we start with the music. Politics. Sorry. She was ready for a typical episode of Mysteries of the Universe. <laughs> it makes sense that we start with the music. And this is where we really see this tension between the expectation that they represent something new and big and this idea of timelessness. One thing that you see, it's something that for the purposes of this podcast, let's call the pop adjacent contemporary artist. The sort of iconic Eurovision example of this is Cliff Richard who was kind of considered the UK's Elvis. John Lennon even called his song Britain's first rock song. He was the third top-selling artist in the entire history of the UK singles chart behind the Beatles and Elvis Presley. You get musical innovation there, right? By the time he competed in 1968, rock had kind of left him behind, right? It was the era of the Beatles. He was no longer cool. 
he finds a home in Christian music and Eurovision, which is the last time I'm ever going to draw that comparison on this podcast. <laughs> if you compare the new on the scene Cliff Richard and the song that John Lennon called Britain's first rock song to his later songs that were in Eurovision, I think you're going to see a difference. So first, let's hear a little bit of Move It. For real country music that just drives along. And then we're going to hear 1968's Congratulations. Congratulations and celebrations when I tell everyone that you're in love with me. We're going to talk to Linda Martin later in this episode. She was one of only five artists to achieve number one and number two at right. Eurovision in separate years. And when you listen to those songs, why me? Could have been successful in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010s, 2020s. And that's the, the beauty of there's certain types of music that whether they're perfectly the most in fashion at the moment, they'll never completely go out of style. Another way to be timeless in your vision is to just do your own damn thing. Hell yeah. And I will say these tend to be my favorite artists. <laughs> when Russia sends grandmas, the grandmas it is. Yeah. When... Karia shows up with his strange mix of genres. No one's sitting there saying, no, that's yeah. not right for us. And when you look at these repeat players, I think probably the best example of this is Stub C. Stub. They basically invented a genre of music, right? That's where their musical innovation comes from. The front, like an Indian shama. They're Moldovan, and they melded rock, hip-hop, drum and bass, jungle, punk, and folk in a way that just created a sound that was entirely their own. You can see the timelessness of that in the fact that they returned to Eurovision three times in three different decades. 2005, where they placed 6, 2011, where they placed 12, and 2022, the first year Eurovision we attended, where they play seven. They didn't have to transition away from anything to become timeless. Right, because they never had an age. Yeah, that's hilarious. what I like to say about myself. She's ageless. Mm. So then the <laughs> next one. <laughs> oh, you monster. <laughs> Another way, I think, is to keep flipping the script, keep changing things around. And Elisabeth Andreasen, who we speak with on the episode today, also known as Betta, that's very much what she did. She first competed for Sweden with a group chips. Then she has another group, Bobby Socks. Then the duet with another artist before she finally does a solo performance in Eurovision. She explores new genres through these collaborations. The best strategy for how to be both contemporary and timeless, iconic, appeal to literally everybody. And that's to just be Lorene. Loreen is the Barack Obama of Eurovision, right? Like, everyone looks at her and sees what they want to see. Eurovision, in a way, needed Loreen to shift a little bit how people looked at Eurovision. Loreen changed the popularity, especially with how Eurovision was seen within pop music. That is 100% it, and points out another thing about these Eurovision icons. They're reflective of the taste of the, the festival, but the minute you become a Eurovision icon, you are the face of Eurovision. So you change the nature of the festival. It's this back and forth, right? Eurovision made Loreen, and Loreen partially made modern Eurovision. Another feature of a lot of Eurovision icons is character creation. You think about Verka. Verka Serduchka, 2007, came in second, has been back at Eurovision many times. Verka Serduchka is a man named Andre, but she is a character that he created. Karia, right? Jere. Obviously, not the same level of theatricality. Even Cliff Richard, his name is not Cliff Richard. That name came from him being like, I want to brand myself as a rock guy, so I'll call myself Cliff. And then Richard was a reference to Little Richard, who was his favorite artist. It's like Lady Gaga named herself after Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes, and I think Lady Gaga is like a perfect example of what character creation allows you to do. It allows you to change character. 
right? That's why you can have like these different eras because you can develop a character. Look at Conchita first, right? right? The persona of Conchita made the message of what she had to say so much clearer. Yeah. There was a concern that this sort of path really sort of limited your options. If we rewind to the 90s or something like that, your path to pop stardom was looking like everybody else. And I kept thinking about the Sunstroke Project, who are primarily known for um, Epic Sax Guy. Something that has had a resurgence on TikTok and stuff like that. Well, and this is exactly my point, right? Is like, pre-TikTok, leaning hard into being Verka or being Conchita, you're not going to like really reach too far out of Eurovision. You're saying that Eurovision was 70 years ahead of its time. A hundred percent. I'm always saying that. (laughs) Even with an icon like Loreen. Yeah. I think that while there's something about her songs that might just be really, really well constructed pop songs, but then you look at the staging. Yeah. And both with Euphoria and with a tattoo. It's fucking weird. It shouldn't work and it just works. And this we get back to Lorene as the Barack Obama of Eurovision. If you want to look at her and go, she is a Swedish global pop queen. Like she is that. If you want to be like, Lorene is a Eurovision artist. She right. is very rooted in the particularities of this festival while at the same time reaching beyond it. I think the thing about an artist representing a country that is actually beneficial to artists is this idea that it gives them a certain amount of timelessness automatically. It puts you in the history books. Take Norway, for example. I grew up with that competition. Every year, they're talking about the two winners, right? It would be Bobby Sox and it was Secret Guard. So you think about Cliff Richard. He's part of a national narrative now. He represented the UK during a time when they were doing so, so well. Linda Martin, a similar thing. People go, can we find back to when we did so well? Yeah. Like when Linda Martin was doing yeah. it, like when Johnny Logan was doing it. Yeah. And these become romanticized figures. That's exactly it. Tying yourself to a national narrative can also be problematic. Dima Balan is another one of those acts who placed both number one and number two in different years at Eurovision. Yes, I get something to be. There are only five acts in the entirety of Eurovision who have done this. So Dima Balan had all of the makings of a Eurovision icon. But Russia invaded Ukraine. Dima Balan represented Russia. Dima Balan endorsed Putin's invasion. You see this now with Israel, that people's feeling of the politics of Israel gets put on their Eurovision Act. Yeah. Another example is Maria Serafovich, who won Eurovision in 2007 with the song Molitva. To take the term icon literally, she became a symbol, right? Very queer presentation wins Eurovision this year that Verka comes in number two. There still, to this day, is a real affinity for Maria Serafovich among LGBT Eurovision fans. And yet, she's a big supporter of right-wing authoritarianism. Her politics, frankly, suck. If you're going to connect yourself to a nation and you're going to benefit from the things that people love about your nation, you need to, as a public figure, figure out what your relationship is to the current government. You represent something. Right. And And as long as people love what you represent, that love will trickle onto you. Yes. But the moment people freaking hate what you represented represents, trickles onto you as well. Even Tali, who is representing Luxembourg because she was born in Israel, gets the hate. No one cared really about what Ali Alexander had to say about Israel until he became the UK's representative and suddenly it was front page news. Oh, girl, she does the best transitions. She really does. It doesn't have to be your relationship to your country's politics. It's your relationship to Eurovision's politics that suddenly become really relevant. And this is where we get to the move of Eurovision's identity and brand from we're a family show to we're a queer family show. Mm -hmm. You rewind to 
Cliff Richard in 1968, or the Swedish Eurovision icon Carola. These are performers who existed in this era before out gay people at Eurovision and out gay people generally. They also both happen to be deeply religious, right? And then Eurovision really starts changing. Just look at the competition now. Like, let's take the last four winners. Lorene, openly bisexual. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know about anyone in Kalush Orchestra. I keep sending them DMs. <laughs> yeah. and that. Monoskin, the bassist, is bisexual. bisexual. And the guys keep kissing on stage. Yeah. Then before that, Duncan Lawrence is married to a man. What happens when you're an icon for a song contest and what that song contest means changes? Again, Cliff Richard behind only the Beatles and Elvis Presley on the UK number ones chart. Corolla, major pop star. But a major part of both of their careers was their success in Eurovision. They represent this fandom that is suddenly queer-coded. And both of them faced backlash for comments they made. In the way that a nation means something, Eurovision also means something. So a Eurovision icon is someone who both, again, has their own individuality like a pop star, but also is part of these two other brands, their country and Eurovision. That, I think, is a real shift Conchita's win when it comes to the queer identity of the competition. Eurovision changing its brand necessarily changed the brands of Cliff Richard and Corolla to the point where it became a career thing for them. So that's the contest changing a Eurovision icon. Now, why did the contest change? It's exactly what you said. A Eurovision icon changed the contest. It's like a beast that feeds on itself, right? Eurovision is an afterthought without its icons. Yeah. There is something amazing about being a Eurovision artist. If you are someone that the fandom decides that they love, you have a place to go every year where you can perform in front of thousands of screaming fans who probably know the words to your songs better than you do yourself. But there is a downside to that. This artist I absolutely was not aware of at all until you brought him to my attention. Tommy Seabach represented Denmark in 1979 with Disco Tango, in 1981 with Straight or Curly Hair, and then in 1993 with Under the Stars of the Sky and was very much associated with Eurovision, right? I think the early 90s were not a great time for the Eurovision brand. And Under the Stars of the Sky, there's an interesting story behind it. Which is, it was a song that he kept trying to get the uh, Danish broadcaster to let him take to Eurovision. He competes in the national final in 1993, wins, but also Under the Stars of the Sky becomes a hit in Denmark, right? So this is like a huge comeback for Tommy Seabach. Then he goes to Eurovision and he places 22nd. The Danish press blames him. And it was very much motivated by, A, people didn't trust his brand already. And then you're going you're gonna to represent our country. Fool of us. And make a fool of us. Yeah, like if anyone should be good at this, it's you. Yeah, this is your entire identity. I think that the tragedy of Tommy Seabach, who essentially drank himself to death, is that he was trapped. There's a real dark side to not having the freedom of forming your own identity. To be on the losing end of a popularity contest doesn't feel great. And to be on the losing side as a nation, where do you place your blame? Right. You know, who is the icon? We're going back to definitionally, this is what icon means, right? You are the symbol of, the face of a nation, the face of Eurovision, right? It raises the stakes. And this is the thing we always find with Eurovision. Right. If anything, Lorena has become the face of the ultimate success of Sweden. Yeah. She's the one who brings home their seventh victory that ties them with Ireland. When you're telling the story of the massive success of Sweden in Eurovision, from now on, that story can never not centrally include Lorraine. I think there's something great about ending on probably the most prominent contemporary icon that we have. But as far as people who have won as performers twice, it's Lorraine and it's Johnny Logan. The recent example is Lorraine. 
And she, again, walks this amazing tightrope where two Eurovision fans, to us, she is the face of Eurovision. To Swedes, she's the face of Swedish pop music. I, I know people in New York who are very familiar with Euphoria as a song. No idea it came from Eurovision, right? It's the, the ABBA and uh, Celine Dion recipe. I think like Celine Dion and ABBA, they are Eurovision icons because they're the most successful. But this is maybe actually the last piece of fan icon relationship. This feeling of ownership that Eurovision fans have over, quote unquote, their stars, Right. They know they have to share ABBA. They know they have to mm -hmm. share Celine. And so there's a little bit less of this passionate, true fan thing going on. Sure. People at Eurovision feel like Lorene is their star. Landing there, it's enough of us talking about icons. And I think it's time we talk with some icons. This is the super, super exciting thing about this episode, which is that we have three actual Eurovision icons and one American icon for you on this episode. We're talking to the Linda Martin, who, if you were paying attention, is one of five artists who placed both number one and number two at Eurovision in the entire history of the contest. We also speak with Elisabeth Andreasen, who uh, also is a person who's both won and come in second place. We are also talking to Senheet, who is another Eurovision icon who has returned to the festival three different times. 2020 was a pandemic year. Nobody competed that year. She came back in 2021 with Flo Rida and the song Adrenalina, giving San Marino its second best result up until that point. We have our American segment, and we can't go into that without an American icon. We speak with Barrett Foa, who was on 12 seasons of NCIS LA, with Barrett, we talk about what it's like to be a return fan favorite year after year as he tries to evaluate what gives Eurovision acts their staying power in a game we're calling Tops and Bottoms, I Can or I Can't. Barrett Foe is going to be on the upcoming Netflix show, The Residents, playing the first gentleman of the United States. But before we get to all of those amazing interviews, let's hear Why Me by Linda Martin. Why me? I look at you and I get to feel it. Why me? I know it's true, but I can't believe it. Okay, welcome back. We're here with Eurovision icon Linda Martin, who has represented Ireland not once, but twice, coming in second in 1984 with Terminal 3 and winning the contest in 1992 with Why Me? Linda, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I don't often do these sort of Zoom calls because yeah, yeah. of where I live, my internet reception is not very good, but you sounded very interesting. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> Charlie. Yeah, I, well, let's... I, I, I to myself, if Charlie puts this out in America, maybe we we'll end up over there. Maybe there'd be a Eurovision night in New York or something. Uh, like oh that. my God, that would just like warm my heart. It would, Absolutely. It would, <laughs> it would save us on some flights, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Linda, could you first talk a little bit about your early relationship to Eurovision? I was singing in a band part-time because I was at school and Donna won in 1970. And I remember watching her performance and I just thought to myself, I want that. So that's where the Eurovision came into my mind. And then I tried for many, many years. It didn't work out until Terminal 3 in 1984. Donna had so many number one records. She was a big star. And when I read that you guys were friends, it was yeah. amazing to me. There's a real community. You know something, Charlie? We're all very friendly. I mean, it's, it's incredible. The people we know through the Eurovision years. And I meet them in airports and things like that. And I wouldn't be that close to them, but everybody seems to know everybody else. Can you talk a little bit about chips? Yeah, I was at school and I had no money. And I saw an ad in the paper and it said they wanted a girl to sing in an established band. And I just went along for an audition and I got it. So we used to work on a Saturday afternoon in an old dog pound, which had been converted into a club. I thought I hit the big time because I was working on a Saturday afternoon, but my father wasn't having any of it. That band was Chips. We were the first band in Ireland to have two female singers. Oh. Up until then, the show bands had brass sections. 
And they are fabulous now, fabulous. But this was something completely different. And we specialized in six-part harmony. We did Mamas and Papas, Fifth Dimension, yeah. all things like that. And it really was successful. And then, like everything else, everybody starts arguing and the whole thing went <laughs> to the wall. Right. And we all went off and did different things. And the funny thing is, then we all came back together again. And that didn't yeah. last very long. Then we all argued again. <laughs> and, and Can you talk about what it was like when I Killed a Man came out? It seems like there was a fair amount of controversy with the song. Yes, that's absolutely. And there shouldn't have been because it's about the American Civil War. But Ireland was in so much trouble at that time that the radio station just said, we're not taking a chance and they wouldn't play it. But there was an English guy who went on to record and somebody in America recorded as well. I still think it's a fabulous song. You, I think, hold the record for the number of times that anyone's competed in Ireland's National Song Contest. We're going to talk a lot about the times you won the national final. But one thing that I think struck us both about you when we saw you in Liverpool was your tenacity. Well, in Ireland at that stage, you were stuck in Ireland. And I just knew that the Eurovision would take me out of Ireland. So that was foremost in my mind. You've heard of Andy Murray, the the tennis player. How many times did he enter Wimbledon? Or if a footballer doesn't score in the first game he plays, do you sack him? You've got to keep on trying. And I knew it would work out eventually. And thanks to Johnny, it did. That brings us first to Terminal 3. Uh, Tell us how that song came about and what it was like working with Johnny Logan. So I'd known him a long time. And he always said, I'm going to write a song for you. And I'd be going, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) And then he came up with uh, Terminal 3. I remember going into the studio. We put it down and away we went to Eurovision. Green as cabbage. We started off in the lead with 12 points. And I remember thinking, oh, Christ, if a horse is leading in a horse race, it's not going to win. You you know where I'm coming from? (laughs) Sure. And unfortunately, it was right. Portugal didn't vote for us. And my cousin was working in a hotel in London and a tour came in from Portugal and he went up to them and he said, you didn't vote for my cousin. You can carry your own bags. And he flounced <laughs> off. <laughs> That's incredible. That's amazing. I love that. yeah. uh, but but it, it, was, it was the most wonderful experience ever. And I worked all over Europe, thanks to Terminal 3, because in those days, Eurovision meant something. It was really, really important. And then Johnny again said, no, I'm going to write you another song and da, 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 da. And then I remember him ringing and said, I've got a song for you. We went over to the studio and we started putting the song down and he wouldn't even let me sing it in the key. I wanted to sing it. He says, no, 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 no. We're taking the key up. It's going to be higher. And I'm saying, Christ almighty. (laughs) But anyway, he got his way in the end and we did the, the song that night, but he couldn't get the bridge in the middle. So we left the studio. Everybody went home. I wasn't in bed too long when the phone rang. I've got the bridge. Get out of bed. Get back to the studio. (laughs) And away we went again. (laughs) So we got it done. And I loved it from the get-go. But you know what juries are like. You don't know what they're going to do. But luck was on our side that night. And of course we won. The first song at Eurovision did so well. I think a lot of people would go, that is almost as close as you can to achieve this dream, but you still went back at it again. I'd learned so much from that first competition in Luxembourg, and I just thought I can approach it a different way if we can get a chance to go back. I love talking to the fans afterwards. You know, some people say, oh, I don't want to be hanging around. I love them. Photographs are no problem. Autographs are no problem. And they write to me, and I write back to them and things like that. The reality is it's a privilege. I mean, that's a huge compliment for somebody to want to photograph with you. you know, and, and I love it. We saw your cover of Euphoria online and thought it was awesome. That's, Can you talk about how that came about? I was working in Malmo and a request came through. Would I appear on TV show? Yes, of course I would. And they wanted me to choose a song. I thought, well, Euphoria is the obvious choice. And they had a band there backing me and they were like the Gypsy Kings. Like they weren't a yes. pop band or a rock band. I thought, oh, Lord, say it is how are we going to do it. But I've got <laughs> the key sorted out. And I actually thought that they did a really good job. I, I, th- I think you have to keep your ears open for all sorts of music because we're, we're used to what's here in, in Ireland with the Irish music. And I'm, I've got friends in Turkey and their music, when I initially started working there in the 80s, it was alien to me. But I sort of recognize Turkish music now. And you, you just have to keep your mind open and your ears open. To talk about that that performance at Euroclub, can you talk about what that night was like from your perspective? I really did enjoy that gig. 
it was electric. You could feel the energy coming off the audience. Yeah, it was yeah. brilliant. I, I would have been on stage longer, but they wouldn't let me. They just said, no, that's, <laughs> that's all we want. That's all we want. And Jedward were there, of course. And I know Jedward very, very, very well. I did pantomime with them for three years. Oh my I was God. in Azerbaijan with them <laughs> as their mentor. They're lovely. They're nuts, but they're yeah. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think makes a good Eurovision song? If you gave me a choice of what sort of song to sing, I'll go for a ballad. Ballads cross right over. They'll appeal to the granny in Hungary. They'll also appeal to the young fella in uh, Spain. You've got a lovely ballad, beautifully presented, with nice lyrics. You're on a winner, I think. Pop songs in Eurovision, it has to be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, break, chorus, key change, chorus. That's just the way it works. And you need to get a good dancing beat behind it. It's a twofold problem. It's the songs to begin with, Mm -hmm. and it's finding the artists that are actually going to sing them and perform them. So we haven't got that circuit anymore of variety shows, theatre, cabarets, discos. We don't know where the talent is. And that's being honest with you, there is talent here. But if if all they can do is sing to an X Factor or uh, Britain's Got Talent or something like that, it's very difficult for young people to get the experience. And experience, I mean, not only singing, but appearing in front of a camera and communicating with an audience. When you think about it, Charlie, if you have no experience and you're selected to sing a song at Eurovision, you go out on that stage and I've seen people bottle. They just cannot take it. It's too big. Yeah. It's way too big. I mean, I don't know. I know one Irish singer who could put across a ballad. <laughs> <laughs> Get Johnny Logan to write a um, duet. Every time when I see him, I keep saying, Jim, are you going to write that duet for yourself, myself? And he just says, F off you. And that's the end. <laughs> I think that's a yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like a yes to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think a perfect note to end on. Linda, thank you so much really? for joining us. This has been really amazing. No, thank you too. For Like I said to you earlier, for somebody to want to talk to you, it's a compliment. Oh, and that's... I accept it as such. And I'm delighted. And I hope if we all make it to Malmo, Will you find me? We'll have a drink together. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. For sure. Then that's that's a date. It's awesome. a date. Yes, I love it. I love it. Next, here's Elisabeth Andreasen's 1985 Eurovision winning song, La de Svinge. Before you got thrown into the world of Eurovision, did you have a relationship to the contest? I grew up on an island outside Gothenburg, very, very tiny little island. And my world from that little island was the TV screen. I saw musicals, I saw films and Eurovision. And I saw Jon Schiff, so Eva Dahlgren and Cliff Richard. Oh, I want to join that. I want to be there. One day. <laughs> yeah. And then I saw this singing competition in the magazine. I made a a tape and the phone was ringing and I didn't turn off the tape. (laughs) (laughs) And from that, I got some questions of, we need a girl who sings, but you should also play the bass. And I said, well, I don't play bass. No, but then you have to learn. Okay, I'll learn. (laughs) I said, but I I don't have any double bass. Well, you can buy mine. I said, okay, so I'll buy it. <laughs> and oh I bought it and it's still in my office. You can see here. This oh is my wall. God. This is the wall with all the gold records. Oh that's my gosh. Incredible. incredible. And that's only half of it. But there is my base. I was in the audience to watch a really big country concert in Stockholm. And in the intermission, I was sitting in the audience and I felt like, some light was coming on my head, like a Steven Spielberg movie, <laughs> uh, telling me this is your night. So I went in backstage and I said, hello, my name is Elizabeth Andreasen and I'm very good. Could I play a song? And the thing is, the guy I went up to was Lasse Holm. Lasse oh Holm. my God. And he said to me, oh, fuck, you're so rude. So I want to hear you. <laughs> so I sang two songs. I will always love you, Dolly Parton, and say to your crown. Emily Harris. Amazing. And after he listened, grabbed me, oh my God, you can you come to my studio tomorrow? I have to make a demo with you. Well, I'll see if I have time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, my dream. 
And I went into the studio and I sang this song and I heard Luster say, you have a contract. That's so amazing. So that was 1981. And then I just jumped on the Eurovision train because I remember when I came into the studio after he said, you have a contract, he said, well, I'm working with a group too called Chips with Kiki Donaldson. Do you want to join us? And I said, Kiki Donaldson. Oh my God. She's my favorite. She's my idol. <laughs> so it all happened in one hour. For my first time in Eurovision, that was absolutely out of my world. I remember the first meeting. I was so happy I couldn't sit. I was just doing uh, this is uh, all the th- all the information. Well, here's the tickets and yeah, 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 blah blah blah. And I was, oh my god, this is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, really. You could see on me that I was living in my dream. <laughs> and I, we love the song Kiki and I, and that's so important. If you do Eurovision, you have to love the song because it's going to be your best friend for the rest of your life. You have to live with that song. Only three years later, you're back on the big Eurovision stage with La de Svinge. I have to start with this little story because the year before, 84, I was competing in, in the Melody Festival and with a song called Charlie's Magie. Not very good. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I was not very good. I was singing a little bit false and everybody was wondering, what are you doing? If somebody came yes. up to me that day and said, well, Elizabeth, next year you will win the whole fucking shit. <laughs> that, was, that was a year before a lot of swing yet. So 85 came and that was just unbelievable. My God. I met Hannah, 83, and she was looking for the other girl in Bobby Sox. We started with our first record in 84 with swing music and it felt really fun. And in the end of that recording, Rolf Lovland came with this cassette. And that was Lada Swinge. And I remember he played it in the phone and I was screaming, jumping out on my bed and just said, oh my God, we're going to win this shit. (laughs) What was the greeting like in Norway coming with the victory in your hands? Oh my God, it turned the whole country upside down. It was the first time and the Eurovision story had been so sad in Norway. All the dance bands, they copied the song over the night and played it the day after. And all the school orchestras, we got telegrams from the prime minister. We were invited for the ambassador dinner with the government. It's right. quite emotionally to be in the history of that. Every time they talk about something big happen in the music industry or happen with Norway, blah, 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 we are always there. It's the moon landing and it's the Bobby Sox. And it's- <laughs> the 1985 win. An interesting thing is that both you and Hannah at that point had separately already both been in Eurovision. It was good for us that we have done it before. Everything went fast. It was like hanging on a train that was running 100 <laughs> kilometers in the, in, in the hour. And, and when it came into the stations, we just shouted, let us wing! <laughs> you know, next day, next day. it felt like that. So we were a little bit prepared. We had this album and we did this swinging tour and we had a big band with horny horns that we call them. <laughs> horns. We call them horny horns. In 1994, you return to the big Eurovision stage for the third time. And this time with the song Duet together yeah. with Jan Werner. He died at only 30 years old at the height of his career. We become friends immediately. I felt immediately that he was my soulmate. Rolf and I had this song duet. We didn't have any singer. Same night, we saw this TV show where Ron Werner was competing and he won. And we were just jumping up in the sofa, Rolf and I. So we called him straight away. And I presented myself as Elizabeth Andreas, and, blah, 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 and he was just shouting, What? <laughs> the real Elizabeth? <laughs> I said, yes. And Rolf Leblanc, I would love to sing with you. And we went into the studio, and shit, goosebumps all over. I've never heard anything like it. We couldn't stop singing together. We, we, right. we did tours, we did Christmas tours, we did records, we did TV shows, we did. Oh my God, we were so good friends. So it was a great big loss when he died. Terrible. 
I have some colleagues I sing with that is really, really good, but not like him. <laughs> with Oslo hosting in 1996, you are back at Eurovision for a fourth time, but this time without another singer by your side. The thing was that Cecil Chishubi got that song and she re rejected it on her album. So they called me from the record company and said, we have a song for you that they want in the Eurovision. I listened to it and my skin was just, oh my God, this is a dream song. I would love to do it. And I remember that night, I have a cousin in, in Seattle and they didn't know so much about my career. So he came with his girlfriend to visit and I fixed two tickets for them. Oh, wow. <laughs> they came straight into the Eurovision, sitting there, and I was number two, and they were shocked. And you know, Americans, they're really, oh, my God. <laughs> Stumbling um, into Eurovision must yeah, be quite yeah, yeah. the experience. <laughs> That's my cousin singing. <laughs> <laughs> Hosting the Melody Festival in Norway was awesome. But I thought that Tor Anderson should win. So you can almost see when I... De declare the winner, I was disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> the poker face wasn't yeah. quite there. <laughs> I was really awful. Oh, shit. She won. Okay. <clears throat> to be a host of the Eurovision, you have to love it. That was a big miss, I think, in Oslo in 96 with Morten Harkett. And uh, right. Morten was almost excusing himself to be there. But Norwegian television did a choice because he was famous. They don't know the history. They don't know anything about Eurovision. And it showed. So much of the staying power of an artist is the ability to kind of keep surprising people, to keep innovating. Can you talk about how you find inspiration to move into uh, new genres or new artistic spaces? One of my dreams, too, was country music so I could go to Nashville. So after Bobby Sox, I was really so pink all over me. But then I have <laughs> something really different now. And then I went to Nashville and made a record. And I was there for three months. It was amazing. I heard that Dolly Parton was coming to a TV show in Gothenburg. And she inspired me so much from I was young. So I sat outside the studio and we had a chat in 15 minutes. And that was a moment of my life. And I told her that... I got discovered with one of your songs. I will always love you. She thought that was quite okay. fun. I mean, she probably heard it thousands of times, but she <laughs> was very there in her mind. I always wanted to be Dolly Parton, but I only become half Parton. Half <laughs> <laughs> Parton. <laughs> Incredible. I love it. Speaking of people who inspire you, yeah. you've had such a variety of collaborators over the years. We've talked about several of them today. To what extent have they inspired you musically? And I got ideas out of listening to others. I go out and see concerts and every type of music, classical concerts, musicals, opera, everything, jazz. I just eat it. And that was the thing that John Bernard did too. When we stopped at gas stations, there were always CDs for 20 oh, kroner yeah. or 50 kroner. He just bought it all. He took the whole thing <laughs> in a bag and bought it. Oh it could God. be 20, it could be 50 CDs <laughs> into the bus. And he sat listening to every, all kinds of music because he wanted to hear different producers, different productions, mm. different sounds, singers. Reflecting back over your storied career, which has been incredible, what do you feel is the most important thing you've learned? I think that is that I am really myself all the time. You can really recognize me when I go on stage, you feel you know me. And if I go off stage and talk to the audience, I'm the same. When I talk to my fans after concerts and stuff, I really feel like we're friends. The Eurovision family is fantastic. I was in Liverpool when the Eurovision was last year. So we sang at the Euro Club and it was amazing. I, I had like 4,000 crazy fans singing in Norwegian in Evie. <laughs> I was so happy. I can still sing those songs in the same key. And that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Old bitch, that's 65. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many fans and they know everything about us. You know, all the colors of my underwear. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when I lost my husband seven years ago, he died in a heart attack. That was really awful. 
terrible. I remember the first time I appeared on stage was only three weeks after. And it was so quiet in the room. Everybody was not breathing. Is she going to sing? Is she going to make it? Is she going to cry? I get goosebumps when thinking about it. And then I felt this community was helping me. It was amazing. It's love in a way. And I was hosting the Pride Festival in uh, Stockholm. And suddenly the the light went out, the electricity. It was in the evening. It was 15,000 people. And it all got dark. So I stretch up my arms and I start, Framling, what do you do for me? 15,000 start singing. It was in the dark. It was raining. Amazing. They sang the whole song without anything. That also is a feeling of family, doing something together. We know this song. We know the history of the song. I say no to so many reality things that they want me to participate in, like (laughs) Spider-Man and this. Uh, I was about to say, have you been called to the farm? Um, It's like a big brother with famous people. Put them on a farm for six weeks. Yeah. And And (laughs) they have to live like it was for 100 years ago. They have to milk the cows. They have to make their own things. And they don't have any food if they don't make it on their self. It gets conflict, quarreling, and some are weak and some are strong. I don't know. Yes, if I yeah, do something, sense. it has to be fun. Right. My daughters and I, we do a little reality now called Sofa. Oh, we sit in the sofa uh, watching TV and you watch us watch TV. <laughs> it, Elizabeth, thank you so much for yes, spending this time with incredible. us. That was so for... fun. You see, we're the family. <laughs> exactly. That's you the family we're talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And here's Sen Heat's 2021 song for San Marino, Adrenalina, the train flow rider. I think we wanted to start with you talking about your first Eurovision experience. I have to confess that I didn't know what Eurovision was that time. 2011, somebody from my company was this freaky guy, crazy for Eurovision. And he said, you must bring Senit to Eurovision. And everybody was, what is fucking is Eurovision? And they were, oh my God, you don't know what is Eurovision? And no, so come with me in San Marino. I come from Italy. And I say, okay, let's do it. But because I didn't know the show, I took very easy, very superficial, like, whatever. Was it a shock when you got to Dusseldorf, the size of it? Yeah, amazing. And the German, they built this huge place, super organized. But in the same time, as I said before, because I didn't know the show, I thought, bah, whatever, I will do this gigs and <laughs> bye. Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. I was so nervous. And I sing Stand By, this beautiful ballad. When I was there, I said... I need to do something up-tempo, but it was too late. When they called me nine years later, and I was prepared. I was ready with new team, new songs, new me. And then, of course, the fucking pandemic arrived, and I was like, no, it's not fair. And I received that, the call from San Marino, and they say, I'm sorry, Senit, but we have to cancel your revision. I thought it was a joke in the beginning. I was crying like a baby. Can you imagine, after nine years, finally, and they canceled the revision? I was devastated. But then two days after, they call me again and they say, okay, there is a possibility to do Eurovision 2021. You want to jump in? I say, fuck yes. I say immediately. But the rules are you you cannot sing freaky anymore. You have to build a new song, a new team, a new dancer, whatever, but everything new. How did the collaboration with Flo Rida come about? The Adrenalina was not built for Eurovision. It was built for like hit summer song. My team, they say, let's try to give to Eurovision a song. And I thought the idea to invite a rapper to sing the song with me. And Florida, he was crazy for the song. And we fell in love and I say, okay. But it was a COVID moment. So he flew from Miami and only in the last, last moment, he went to Rotterdam. And it was a big surprise for me too. So I saw for the first time Florida the day before my first rehearsal. Oh my gosh, I was literally just about to ask when did you meet him for the first time? It was the first big event after almost two years of COVID. 
And I didn't feel the competition because everybody was so excited finally to sing alive. Being able to come back to Eurovision several times, it makes you somewhat of an Eurovision icon. The Eurovision fandom is a very unique fandom, a very dedicated fandom. What's kind of been your experience? I mean, they support me a lot. I'm alive for the fans of Eurovision. I'm a freaky queen thanks to you. And probably in some point I gave them a big gift through the freaky trip to Rotterdam. They canceled the Eurovision 2020. With all my team of 2020, they say, okay, let's try to build something, to give something to the orphans of Eurovision. I say, okay, freaky was my song. So let's build the long trip to Rotterdam through the um, big iconic legend song of Eurovision, but in a freaky way. You understand? So this is why we be like, free kid trip to Rotterdam. Luca Tomazzini, the director, he pushed me a lot. And then slowly I become the fucking freaky queen. One quick question before we have to wrap up. You added an H to your name. So my name is Senhit, but it's impossible to pronounce. So I said, let's cut the H, let's do Senit. But then my father get pissed and I say, no, 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 go back to your name. I say, okay. So it's like Sanit, but with H. Sanhi, thank you so much for speaking with us. Cannot wait to see the show. It's going to be incredible. Euroverse. Winning the love of any fandom is no easy task. But those who make it into the hearts of a dedicated community like Eurovisions have a network of passionate supporters who will be with them for life. The artists who have been selected to return to Eurovision again and again occupy a truly special place in the pantheon of the contest's biggest names. So we're going to explore what sets a Eurovision icon apart from the rest in a very special edition of Eurovision Tops and Bottoms that we're calling Icon or I Can't. <laughs> or if we're in the UK, it would be Icon. We, you should replace me with a Brit and then the pun will work. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I lived in the UK for three and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Count. You, you, you count, you count, you can't. Uh. So, to help us explore what gives an artist staying power, we're joined by a real-life fan favorite himself, Barrett Foa. In addition to being an accomplished Broadway performer, Barrett played Eric Beale on NCIS LA for 12 seasons, which is more seasons than even the most iconic Eurovision act has ever been asked to return. Barrett, welcome and thank you. It's so great to be here. Hi, guys. So good to see you again. Hi. Yes, yeah, so know, and, and you. you don't have to be underwater this time. I, well, <laughs> so we haven't we haven't told Barrett about the game yet. Uh -oh. <laughs> there might be an underwater component. Can we catch yeah. the audience up on what we're talking. Oh about? yeah, that, that's a very good point. The reason we say that Barrett gets to be dry this time is that. He also started my music video, where he was underwater for hours. <laughs> and hours and hours. And hours. <laughs> As the one person on this podcast who is not underwater, I think it builds character. I really, I think... <laughs> I'm a stronger person for it, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, we know how being underwater works, but Charlie, how does this game work? <laughs> well, look at that <laughs> what, a, what a transition. <laughs> um, so the way this game works, Garrett, is we're going to play you a Eurovision performance by a particular artist. And then we're going to play you another performance by that same artist. Now, the second performance could be their triumphant return to Eurovision, or the performance could be their failed attempt to re-enter Eurovision. You, Barrett, are going to have to identify which is which, and therefore whether the artist you're watching is a Eurovision mainstay or just a Eurovision one-hit wonder. Going into this... What is your base knowledge on Eurovision? Because the game was called Tops and Bottoms, I thought it was going to be a completely different question. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we begin, what's your knowledge about yeah, Tops yeah, yeah, and Bottoms? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, I don't know almost anything about Eurovision, except for the fact that my good friend and co-star on the show for 12 years, Daniela Rua, was the host when Portugal was the winner. Did I watch that year to support my friend? No. <laughs> but i was proud of her and i've of course heard about eurovision i know the whole like the abba started there and i did a little research for this podcast so I, because you guys know you're so prepared and researched so well researched i really have been learning a lot about eurovision so thank oh, you awesome but i've never watched a clip or heard anything from yours so i have no idea what it looks like 
That's what the year Daniela hosted. It was a very dramatic year. Someone stormed the stage and took the microphone out of the artist's hand. So all that NCIS LA training, where did that come in? She should have stopped him. <laughs> I like to imagine that after the broadcast, she was like trolling the streets of Lisbon. If anyone could tackle but, someone, it would be Daniela Rua. Or at least her stunt double. <laughs> <laughs> I like that she brings That's her stunt. the problem. They didn't hire her stunt double with her. I think I think people should bring a stunt double for That's life. That's true. Mine would mostly be like walking upstairs and reaching <laughs> things in high places. Can you get that towel for me? My back is going to go out. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So, Barrett, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you and the writers uh, navigated growing... Eric over the years? And did you confront resistance from fans who maybe were like invested in an initial version of the character? Yes. And absolutely not. (laughs) At first they made Eric Beale a surfer because we were like, it's NCS LA. No one actually talked to me about that. It just (laughs) sucks. The scripts. I'm not a surfer and I don't really give surfer energy. So Barrett, <laughs> people look at you and they see water. <laughs> they just so they surferized me, but it just wasn't a fit. And I think the, the writers realized that. And then they started turning Eric into more of like computer geek. The second part of the question was the fandom. And the answer to that is I have no idea because I did not follow the fandom. Sometimes something would come my way and I'd be like, that is interesting, but not interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> My response to everything I tell you. <laughs> These Eurovision artists too. It is interesting when you see a performance that becomes iconic and then that artist then tries to like go on it and take the fandom in a different direction because artistically they're growing and they're in a different place. That's sort of the problem. I was listening to one of your episodes and this woman's like, I, I would wake up in the morning and look at what the fans would say. And then I couldn't get out of bed. And I was like, things I don't need in my life. Like- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Estonia is where we are starting our game. First up, we have the band Malcolm Lincoln. You might think that this is a person, <laughs> but Malcolm Lincoln is actually a band named after a moment on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, where a contestant identified the 16th president of the United States as Malcolm Lincoln. (laughs) And so first we're going to hear their 2011 Eurovision song, Siren. Okay, already this looks like a mix of The Temptations on the stage of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. (laughs) <laughs> but then there's also like a sort of a 60s shag element, strokes element. This camera work is me nausea. It's a lot of <laughs> spinning, 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 spinning. He's pointing a lot. It's a little hop and a, ooh, a flare. Immediate thoughts, reactions. Got his velvet jacket and his shaggy hair. And I feel like it's like three notes. It's cute, but it's not totally grabbing me. But I'm excited to see the next clip. Which is called Bye. We are asking if Malcolm Lincoln returned to Eurovision with this song or if their road to becoming Eurovision icons got cut short. Okay, some falsetto here. He's not a front man to me. (laughs) It's sort of like Jack McBrayer (laughs) meets maybe one of those blonde haired guys in Harry Potter. It's a little bit more of the same. And I don't know why this this blue blazer was picked. It does not (laughs) not seem like an upgrade. I'm going to say I can't. And you are 100% correct, Barrett. This first song did not even make it out of the semifinals. It's just like there are too many layers of irony in a way for you really Mm -hmm. to connect to them. It's like the band's Malcolm Lincoln. There's five different kinds of retro going on where it's like the Temptations. I think you also said the Strokes. It's an identity crisis. Yes. Put it in song. Which actually, (laughs) identity crises are the one thing that keep returning in my life, but just (laughs) not And also on Eurovision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So next, we're going to move to Elisabeth Andreasen, or Bettan, which she's more commonly known as, who is part of the pop duo Bobby Socks that entered Eurovision with La De Svinge in 1985. Can you see why I gave Magnus this person? <laughs> <laughs> Harmony 
Grammys. 80s pizzazz. Love the neon. Uh, uh, and I like, there's like the, the 50s throwback, which was big in the 80s. Love the gloves. I don't know about the skirt, but it's sort of circus tenty, but. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. <laughs> there for it. I feel like this was the moment. They're sort of not in the age bracket of what a pop star would look like right now. You said not a uh, typical age bracket of a pop star. We're going to move about a decade later. Now, it's not Bobby Sox, but Beth Thumb is still there. E. Abby Hunt. For forever. Already, I'm just getting like a Hillary Clinton vibe. Totally. Strong haircut. Oh. Okay, sort of like a mixy thing. What song is that? Hold on, this sounds like... Don't cry out loud, just keep it inside. Learn how to hide your feelings. Peter Allen, these boxy blazers. Oh, a pan flute is happening. <laughs> <laughs> is that a traditional Norwegian instrument? <laughs> <laughs> the pan suit is actually a traditional folk Norwegian costume. The intervals are tried and true. It's an ear hook and an earworm. But I don't know if this would have like really popped pop for me. So I'm going to say maybe I can't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to break it to you, Barrett, but that's Feel wrong. Right. Um, the first song, La De Svinga, won the competition in 1985. And E. Evihit came in second. So 11 she, years later, yeah. She's one of the few people who has managed to both take um, first place and second place. It's a very small Not just that. She has been in the competition four times, all times landing in the top 10, and a guest on this episode. Oh my God, I, <laughs> I, I just dragged her, and she's the guest. It was the lightest, lightest drag, Barrett. The number of times that we've had a guest on this podcast who I'm like, they're the face of fascism. Anyway, <laughs> now cut to. One of the things that I like about those two clips, though, is the sort of evolution of it. I really love the, the swing song. But there's something cool that she has this other side of her that is like this total like power ballad. I like to say that Eurovision treats their stars the way Broadway does. In that they don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you look at the ultimate pop diva, it's going to be people in their 20s, maybe 30s, right? When we look at the ultimate divas of Broadway, it's going to be like women in their 60s and 70s. And Eurovision functions a little bit similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have Katie Wolf, who represented Hungary in 2011 with what about my dreams? Which actually is <laughs> a question I ask myself a lot in the mirror. So. <laughs> this color is very now from last week's episode of RuPaul's Drag Race, but that's another story. Some raver action here. Okay, I, w I went to Burning Man with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like Marley Madlin to me. Oh well, my God, totally. Yeah. Initial reactions. I'm not super excited about what Katie Wolf has to say next, but that was... <laughs> wow. Entertaining <laughs> enough. Maybe Katie can make up for it with this next song. This was 2015. I'm scared this ballerina is gonna upstage her. <laughs> it's like a parking bar. Does she have it? Okay, so I love the slit. I love the fan. I feel like this did well. This was a glow up, and I'm gonna say icon. She did song. really poorly on both mm. of those songs. You, Barrett, seem to sense that that first song did not place well at Eurovision, which it did not and she did not make it back in. I was like watching these clips today and I was like, this is fucking fierce. I love What About My Dreams. Again, it really does, hashtag representation matters, relate to my life. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> in that you can't hit the notes? <laughs> also, well, his really favorite fun. vocalist is Elaine Stritch. That's the thing. <laughs> right. But, no. but not even actress, just vocalist. No, just like, what, what do I want to... <laughs> my alarm is set to her screaming rise over and over and over again. <laughs> is that what <laughs> you want, literally? 
<laughs> yeah. are going to rise. That's actually. Yeah. And then I wake up and I shout, what about my dreams? Here we have Senhit, who represented San Marino with Stand By. I like the syncopation. She's got personality, great, yeah. great smile. Oh my God, that sounds like my mom trying to set me up on a date. They have a great personality. <laughs> I don't understand what these two guitarists are doing on stage. They might not either. <laughs> I like it. Her charm, her, her connection to the camera, to the audience. I'm taken. So now we're going to move to 2021 with Adrenalina. What's happening? Oh, this is a choice. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Visuals. Was she honoring Flo Rida? I'm sorry, Barrett. We have to have you guess before we explain. I don't know what she was doing or where it was going, but I liked the visuals and it seemed modern. So I'm just going <laughs> to say I can't. So, yes. And you are correct. Yes. Initially, she was going to return in 2020. That was the year that was canceled. And then she was invited back in 2021 with Adrenalina. And up until the grand final, there was a big question. Is Flo Rida going to show up? <laughs> Flo Rida shows up at Eurovision and has no idea what Eurovision is. <laughs> and keeps telling everybody that he has no idea what Eurovision <laughs> is. And he performs in the grand final at Eurovision. She's tonight performing at $3 Bill in, here in Brooklyn. Do you think I can make it? We'll we're, be there. We're going to be there, and we're sitting down talking with her as well. Yes. So she will also yeah. be on this episode. <laughs> Why was she wearing that face crown thing? <laughs> that feels risky for a live performance. Yes. There's like a mic handoff moment. I feel like maybe it's probably pre-recorded. Not pre-recorded at all, Barrett. And it's no. illegal in Eurovision. And also Eurovision in most countries airs without commercials. There's a limit of 40 seconds that you have to set the stage before you begin. Eurovision has had opera dangling on a giant pogo stick. They've had human-sized hamster wheel, a double-sided burning piano. Is there a blooper reel, though? This is the thing that's wild about Eurovision. I always say that I feel like it's a techie's wet dream. I downloaded that movie. <laughs> Generally speaking... There's not mistakes. You guys have so many names and dates and countries and facts in your little brains. So I don't really know what else you have room for. Barrett, that's the problem. I'm not like a functional human being. <laughs> we do have another singer that we are going to introduce you to, Barrett. Her name is Linda Martin. And the first clip that you're going to watch was her representing Ireland in 1984. The song is called Terminal 3. I'm already feeling this white jumpsuit. Nails, dangly earrings, one short, one long. Trumpets, I feel like there's an over the bar phrasing here, which we really like. Lean, I love the lean, and then the reach and the grab. I feel like this bracelet is not really matching the belt or the necklace. <laughs> I'm, I'm really into this. I'm excited to see what she's going to bring next. So this is 1992. So we're talking eight years later. And the song's title is another question I frequently ask myself. Why me? Okay, a little more park and bark. Got an elegant gown. I really like her vocals. Good like, technique. Healthy. And she's phrasing well. Coloring the notes, nice like spinny vibrato. She's singing all the way through the phrases. It feels a little fuddy, almost like a step backwards, like almost going into like backwards into 70s, like Karen Carpenter era. We will say time is a construct in Eurovision. Okay. Good yeah. <laughs> the viewing audience for Eurovision, they market it as a family show. So there always is a little bit of a gap between Eurovision and the charts because it's not as youth skewed. Like this was 92 and countries, I believe at this time, were still required to provide a full orchestra for acts. 
because you know that's what music is. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, sounds like it. I, you know, I feel like this this sort of like not like forward thinking, but I'm into it, and I'm going to say icon. A hundred percent correct. Yes, yes. you nailed it. <clears throat> Linda Morton is an absolute icon. That first song came in second, and the second song won the competition. Yes. There are only five people in the history of Eurovision, I believe, who have done that. And then beyond that, both of these songs were written by this guy, Johnny Logan, who is one of only two Eurovision artists to win the competition two times as a performer. And also then, obviously, he won it as a songwriter, too. So the Irish really like him. Another amazing fact about Linda Martin is that she is also a guest on this episode. <laughs> this is a <laughs> with stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're doing an Icons episode, you got to get the Icons. Are you developing a theory on what makes a Eurovision Icon, Ooh, Barrett? I think I am. I think that it's like, do you have stamina? Can you make it through all of these semifinals and year after year and even come back? I just didn't realize the scope, how it could be like park and bark and how it could be like a zillion dancers and visuals and lights and lasers and smoke. I feel like it, it really has range. And I was surprised at that. Barrett, thank you so much for thank you so joining much for being us. On the I love this. Educating and enlightening. Euroverse. That episode was just iconic. It truly was. And thank you to Linda Martin. Thank you to Elisabeth Andreasen. Thank you to Senheed. Thank you to Barrett Foa. I mean, what a jam-packed episode, Charlie. And thank you to you, Magnus. Oh. Next week, uh, we have a very special episode for you. Um, and it is about the Intervision Song Contest, or the ISC. The ISC was the Eastern Bloc version of Eurovision that was on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And we have some very special guests. Thank God for Dean Valetic, who is both an expert on Eurovision, but also the ISC. And not just that, an historian who specializes in Eastern Europe. If Dean Valetic is the ISC expert, Chris Malamphy is the expert on the Billboard Hot 100. He hosts the Slate podcast Hit Parade. And so what's so fun about this is um, we put him in a situation where his expertise did him no good because Chris is going to be talking about ISC songs with us. So you're going to get to hear some uh, Intervision songs. And we're doing this in a game called Intervision Tops and Bottoms, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the ISC. If you're not already drooling for next week, you should be. Yes. But until then, Happy Eurovision. Eurovision.